Hi, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sylvia. And so, um, back in the day when you introduced yourself to a French man or a French woman, they would say to you, enchanté. And that means I am enchanted to meet you. And those of you who know me know, know that I spent 15 years in South Louisiana, and the French in South Louisiana is totally different than the French in France. So you don't know if I just butchered that pronunciation. Or not. <laughs> so take my word for it, that's the page of the French pronunciation. <laughs> so it's all about what I want to talk to, to you today is, is to go beyond the mechanical use of the law that we do so very well. We talk about the bit of magic, the bit of feeling that goes beyond that. And so the very ancient religious traditions, they knew very well they lived in a physical world. And it was a bit of a doggy dog existence. And they would stare at the night sky and they would vision this dark colander of a sky with light shining through. And one of the original deities was a feminine deity called Ishtar. It was the Babylonian deity. And back in the day, you know, we always think that the feminine deities are the Mother Earth, but it wasn't always such. So different traditions have different one. So this was a deity of light. And later on, the Egyptians incorporated another deity, feminine again, called Isis, the real Isis, not the stuff you hear on CNN and stuff like that. <laughs> and this real Isis was associated with the moon, a little softer light. So for, for these people in these traditions, there was three parts of life. There was the physical world that they lived in. And they were much more attuned to the physical world than we are because there was no texting, no cell phones. They lived and breathed and heard the earth their entire life. And there was the light that they viewed as transcendent. There would, if they could touch the light, they could bring the light into their space, they would be able to transform their space. But there was a transcendent light, and this is where they were in this physical world. They needed some magic to bring it together. So they needed some magic or some wisdom. So they always had this deity that brought the pieces together, brought the transcendent into the physical, they transcended their life and made it something very, very special. And uh, different groups use different things. Um, the Greeks use that, and that's the deity uh, called Hermes, and that's all about the Hermetic teaching. It's about bringing the wisdom to transform the life, to get the transcendent life <coughs> intermingled with the physical life. And the Gnostics were very much so. The Gnostics said, the physical life was terrible. If we can just transcend it, then we'll have our nirvana. So if you don't believe in a magical world, remember, we're living on a blue planet that's circling a ball of fire. <laughs> and there's a moon hanging by close to us that moves the sea each and every night. So you see what we do very well here in this tradition we do very well with the manifestation, with the mechanical use of the law of cause and effect. And Ernest has told us this time and time again. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And Thomas Troy would tell us, paraphrased, the greater understanding we have of the law, we will create the most profound effects. So it's not understanding the law is just a mechanical thing. It's understanding the law with the love and the feel of nature involved. And Ernest Holmes told us the same thing. He said, know that there is something more than law, an intelligence to which we may come for inspiration, for guidance, for direction, a power responding to us, a presence pressing against us, an animation flowing through us, a light within us. So we get to that special feeling, that special feeling where we're doing the treatment. And we get to the point where we absolutely know that we know. We have this feeling. We know the truth. We know we are the truth. And you can cut that feeling with a knife. It's not just reading the words out of a science fun textbook anymore. It's knowing the truth and speaking your truth and speaking your truth with authority. 
You see, we've got to get beyond the physical law. And the best way to get beyond the physical law is to create your own spiritual practice. And the key to that is creating that special relationship of you, of who you are, with the oneness of spirit. And Emerson told us that imitation is suicide. So I'm going to share some of my experiences, but my, my advice to you is don't go do what a minister tells you to do if it doesn't work. Don't go do what a practitioner tells you to do if it doesn't work. Go find something that works for you. And as Ernest Holmes told us, if it's not working for you, you don't know what to do. You sit in the silence until the inspiration comes to you. So for me, and we all have different spiritual practices. So my spiritual practice, I'm sure, hardly anyone else in the room would ever dream of doing this. <laughs> so my spiritual practice happens at the beach at night. So when I go out and I stare at those dark waters, I see undifferentiated spirit out there. I see all that is good, that is bad, that is indifferent. And I see this magical law that works, and the law is represented by the waves that break on the shore. They continue to break over and over again. And so they break with a lot of power, too. So if I'm working on anything, I use those waves to help me out. So if I'm working on something that I know is really not a reality, the truth for me, but it keeps coming up. So I will throw it into the wave over and over again. And guess what? It breaks it apart every time and washes it away. And sometimes it takes me an hour to, to deal with these things. But sometimes I don't do it that night. I have to come back another night. But to me, that dark ocean is all that ever is, good, bad, or indifferent. And over st staring at the ocean, I have, some, I have a certain wave that I recognize. It's called a doubt-removing wave. So the way this doubt-removing wave looks, you see way out there, it's breaking on that side. You see it's breaking out there. Even though it's, I've gotten older and I'm at night, I don't see quite as much. In the middle, I can see this dark swell. And I know that there's not a doubt in the world that that wave will not break. And the funny thing is, is that if I wait for it to break, and it seems like the longer it waits, the more magnificent it becomes. It's like it's gaining energy. So, the other part of your spiritual practice is, your spiritual practice is to stop seeing yourself as different. And so, I, the my analogy I have for that is, you can be riding the crest of the wave, but the moment you see yourself as different, attached, or special, the wave has no power without the rest of consciousness, without the rest of your community around. So without the oneness of the wave, you could be up on the crest of it, but it won't last. So what do we do? We get in this wonderful sense of community, and we start to understand ourselves. And that's why the classes here are so good. We get with others, and we share their peak experiences. We revel and celebrate with them. And then we empathize with their down experiences. We know that we've been there. And slowly, by talking to each other, coming to the realization that they're just like me, a person searching for their spiritual path, slowly, we start to get a bit better, a bit happier. Sometimes it happens not so slowly. Sometimes we get a lot happier. And we start seeing this magic. Now this magic, and we see it in our spiritual leaders, Reverend Peggy was asked to give a prayer to the new practitioners. The brand new practitioners, we have like a celebration and indoctrination every December. And she had to share her favorite prayer. And the word that kept coming to her was, wow. So this is the sense of magic. This is the sense of knowing the law at a different level. So we come, and we start feeling good. We start giving this key to our happiness. So we start to resonate with people like Ralph Waldo Trine, 
those of you who don't know Ralph Waldo Trine, there's a great book called In Tune with the Infinite. It was written in 1907, and this is one of the books that Ernest read while he was putting together this great philosophy. So you've heard Reverend Josh say he has books he can just open to any page and it's meaningful. Well, that's my book. So um, I take five minutes break from work with my Kindle and I open that book. And this is what he says about manifesting. He says, is it better to have material possessions or to come into the knowledge of such laws and forces that every need will be supplied in good time, to know that no good thing shall be withheld, to know that we have it in our power to make the supply always equal to the demand. So now we're there. We've got community. We've got to figure it out. We've got these great spiritual leaders here. We've taken the classwork. And we've become what we call a masterful manifester. We know how to do things. We know how to use the mechanical law. And remember that wave I was, I was talking about when you're on the crest of the wave? You're on the crest of the wave. And you're feeling good about yourself. And you're looking down, you see maybe other people in the drop of the wave. And you say, man, I'm great. I'm this magical manifester. I can do anything. And at that point, guess what? You fall down. Now you're in the trough. Now you're in the trough. It's dark. It's cold. It's not like riding on the crest anymore. And you lose your key. Your key to happiness, you lose. So what do you do? It's cold down here. It's dark. This is like the shadow space. But you go back up to the light. Now this is your community. You go back up. Go see your friends. What do they tell you to do? Oh, do your treatment and do your affirmation. Do these affirmations. They work for me. You've got to do them a thousand times. Mm -hmm. It's mechanical law, and it'll work, and you do it over and over and over again. But you don't feel any better. Yeah? You go see Reverend Peggy or Reverend Josh, and they absolutely tell you the truth, but tell you that it's up to you that they can't do it unless you participate. Well, your heart's just hurting. You don't know what to do. It's still not working. Your key to happiness is down there, and no one's helping you with it. Because you want someone else to go do it for you. And no one will do that. Or isn't that cruel of them? <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I use um, some of my favorite teachers from the early New Thought period. So the first, first one will be Judge Thomas Stroh. He'll come and talk to me. And he'll say like five or six jumbled, run-on sentences. But after years of study, I can understand what he's saying. <laughs> and he says, he says, listen to me this time. I'm not going to give you any highfalutin way of using the law and logic. That's not going to fix it this time. Remember I told you the universal mind had a feminine aspect to it? That feminine aspect that knows how to create life and knows what is best for life. And it will whisper to the logical part of the mind. And it will get you where you're going. And you start to feel a little better. And then um, the other person who comes to me is Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> now, he's a brilliant man. But typically when he comes and visits me, he's mad. <laughs> <laughs> he's really mad now. <laughs> so he comes and, and says, now haven't I told you time and time again that every individual is yet another divine incarnation of the divine mind? Yes, and haven't I told you that the light comes from within? All you have to do is speak your word and it will be done. He says, well, why don't you do that? He says, do I have to give you yet another copy of my essay, Self-Reliance? You read it, you taught class, so you still don't get it, do you? <laughs> so all of a sudden, the tough love takes, takes effect. And you realize what you need to do. You realize you need to get out of the light, your light from your community. And you need to go down and get your key to happiness. And the funny thing happens when you go down. Guess what? The light came with you. It was within you the entire time. And you pick up your key, then you're blessed again. And now you realize what Dr. King was talking about. When your life is working, you can walk and never grow weary. You can look up and see the stars sing together. And the sons and daughters of God sing for joy. 
And if Dr. King was here today, he would soften his rhetoric a little bit <laughs> and say, the power of love rolls down like waters and the joy of consciousness like a mighty stream. So my challenge to you today is go within. Go grab that magic that you know is with you and go live your life as if you truly remember who you really are. Namaste. Thank you.